um, wow. Okay, after that amazing introduction, um, I'd like, just like to say, number one, thank you for inviting me here. This is, this is awesome. I mean, anytime someone's like, you can spend 45 minutes or more talking about prostate, I'm just in heaven. So, um, but number two, okay, after all that low expectation, so it, yeah, what she didn't tell you about that 30-page CV, it's actually written in 40 font, so um, it's, it's, it's not that long. Um, I also noticed that there are free cookies there, but according to the sign, I have to get through this presentation before I'm allowed one. So that is very motivational. That's their, uh, <laughs> I should have made it a 10 slide presentation. Okay, um, first slide, oh, there's me. Oh, hold on, it's not advancing. Arrow, arrow, arrow. Okay, let's try again. Yay! Yeah, I've got a lot of publications, but apparently none of them are in how to um, function a PowerPoint presentation. So um, I do have a disclosure uh, in that I am a consultant with uh, Janssen uh, Research and Development, mainly in their um, uh, bladder cancer clinical trials. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, prostate pathology and sort of what's new and what's happening, um, specifically in, in targeted biopsies of the prostate, um, this, the many issues that we encounter with quantification of grade four, uh, specifically in grade group two tumors, and how that affects active surveillance. We'll also talk about some of the um, hot topics for emerging pathologic predictors of outcome, uh, specifically the different types of pattern uh, for morphologic uh, patterns, uh, invasive crib reform cancer and introductal carcinoma of the prostate. And we're gonna do all of that in exactly 43 minutes and 12 seconds. Okay, so once upon a time, before we could see prostate cancer on imaging, and I was in uh, urology residency, and dinosaurs roamed the earth. So um, it started with six cores. I don't know if anyone remembers this, and I'm talking to pathologists, so they're like, why would I remember this? Uh, I was not actually biopsying people's prostates, but once upon a time, the, we took six cores, we took one core from every quadrant and called it a day, and then pretty quickly, um, people discovered that more is better, right? And so um, there was a lot of literature that came out that said if you go from six cores to 12 cores, that you would improve your detection rate um, of, of prostate cancer, and uh, you would uh, also improve um, the corresponding sort of grade on your radical prostatectomy. Um, the only problem was you had this very big increase uh, in clinically insignificant tumors. And what that means is basically we're talking about grade group one, Gleason score three plus three, uh, tumors that are low volume. Um, and, and we believe these are clinically insignificant tumors because they're basically tumors that men are going to die with and not from, okay? Um, and we all know that uh, the goal of detecting um, prostate cancer is, is not so that we can operate on every single person who has prostate cancer, right? The goal is to identify those people who are gonna benefit from having their prostate taken out, especially considering the high amount of um, morbidity that is associated with radical prostatectomy, and uh, namely two things, which is impotence and incontinence. So prostates that you can live with should stay in, and those that are gonna kill you should come out. Um, and this is the, um, the general schematic for um, what you're hitting when you are going to do your standardized um, quadrant biopsy. Okay, this is what the prostate looks like on ultrasound. And um, I just put this up there because if anyone tells you that they can see prostate cancer on transrectal ultrasound, that person is lying to you. They're lying to you. Do not believe them. Okay, uh, because basically what we would use the ultrasound for is literally to make sure we're hitting the prostate, okay? And, and you know, even apex, mid, mid, base, I mean, we could generally guarantee right versus left, and that's about it. Um, but this was considered the gold standard for a long time, right? You'd go in and you would randomly hit the prostate and hope for cancer. Um, and you can imagine doing that with any, literally, any other tumor. 
Uh, can you imagine okay, breast cancer? Okay, ma'am, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a needle, we're going to stab you in the breast 12 times, and we're going to look at it and hope we hit your cancer. Like, there's no woman, no offense, guys, there's no woman in the world that's going to go for that. And, and, like, good for guys for being like, stab me. Like, but the, the, but the, the you know, a little tongue-in-cheek, but the truth is they had... <laughs> No way, no choice, because that was the best we could do because we could not see where the lesion was, right? And so even though it was the gold standard, it was a bit of a, a, a bird box moment, right? Um, and, and because of that, because we're randomly uh, stabbing needles into the prostate, and we don't know what we're aiming for, and prostate cancer, to make it even more fun, is a multifocal disease, and some of it is important, and some of it isn't, you could literally be accidentally coming across um, a tumor that does not matter while completely missing the tumor that does matter. And especially in the anterior gland, it is very hard to appropriately position your needles to hit the anterior prostate. And so a lot of anterior tumors were just being missed. So there's no surprise that even when you had the best pathology, right, three plus three, you know, grade group one, minimal volume, one core, you still had a very minor correlation with your radical prostatectomy findings. And that's not good. But prostate MRI has made a huge difference. Um, and, and this is what it looks like, and we'll go over that. So multiparametric prostate MRI uses three parameters to identify lesions. And it basically has everything to do with, like, flow of water, right, and vascularity. It's just to like, you know, when I asked my radiology friends to explain it, and then they did, and I said, okay, what I heard you say to me is words, 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 MRI, words, words, words. So please explain it to me in a way I can understand. So they said two things, right? Flow of water and vascularity. So things that are very vascular, like big clumps of tumor, are going to have contrast go to them and light up. I was like, hey, that makes sense. Also, clumps of tumor that are very dense are going to have different flow of water than other parts that are not. And that's it. And like, I too could become a radiologist. <laughs> I'll do, that'll be my third residency. Um, okay, so, T2-weighted images, tumors are dark. Diffusion-weighted images, they're still dark. And on the contrast, they're bright. So, this is what it looks like. Here's our T2-weighted image. You can see the arrow, it's dark. Here's another one. It's the darkness within the darkness. And then here's this one, which is my favorite because it's lighting up like a Christmas tree. So that's fantastic. So there's your lesion. Now that is something that you could actually stick a needle in, right? And then there are ways of scoring these lesions. So basically, um, how much does the radiologist, how sure are they that it's cancer? Okay, so PIRAD system, uh, very similar like BIRADS in the breast and all the other X, IRADS other places. Um, so this one was first established in 2012. Um, it's gone through uh, several renditions and we are now on uh, version 2.1. Um, and uh, basically this is just to make uh, the inter-reader variability uh, less and clarification and simplification of the interpretation criteria. Um, and also, they got rid of um, MR spectroscopy. So um, it, it generates a five-point scale, um, and the higher the score, the more likely it is that it's cancer. In a recent meta-analysis, they said if you looked at all the papers together, if you're at a, a PIRADS of five, um, it's actually anywhere from about a 70 to 80 percent chance that you're going to have cancer there. So um, what does that mean to me? That means if I have a PIRADS five lesion, and it is benign, there are some things I'm going to look for that benign mimickers can cause something to light up, like, um, you know, uh, granulomatous, uh, nonspecific granulomatous pilo uh, <laughs> nonspecific granulomatous prostatitis uh, would give you a very high uh, pyrads. If you hit a BPH nodule, it's going to be a high pyrads. If you have a lot of basal cell hyperplasia and et cetera, right? Um, if you don't see anything like that, if it just looks like very benign looking glands, I get levels. I actually get, we already get three levels, and I level into it, and I can't tell you how many times that I've actually found prostate cancer in PIRAD5 lesions where the first three levels were benign. So if they say it's there, there's a very good chance it is. Or they missed. 
and we can go, I can spend an hour talking about why we miss. Um, so there you have it. Okay, so this is how uh, this works, right? So what we do at, um, at Vandy and, and probably what they do here, um, there's a machine called the Artemis. And it basically is a combination of the MRI image with real-time ultrasound when you do your transrectal guided ultrasound, okay? So basically, you start off, the patient goes to the machine, they get their scan, you circle the prostate, um, you, you highlight the area, the region of interest, okay? And that's all done before the patient ever shows up to the clinic. Then in clinic, uh, when you're doing your transrectal uh, guided biopsy, the, uh, the Artemis software lines up the ultrasound image with the MRI image and a little dot pops up where you are supposed to hit with your needle. And you do. And that's it. It's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, it's great. So um, I'll show you a video of what it looks like. So this is the, um, the MRI image is below. Transrectal ultrasound is above. And when everything uh, lines up, uh, you go ahead and hit the dot. So what, what you should be looking for is you will see a little bit of movement off to the left. That is the needle starting to poke into the prostate, and then you will see it um, fire. So let's see if that works. Okay, we're in, we got motion. Okay, so we go. We see the little dot is what they're trying to hit. Everything is lined up. There's the needle going in, and boom, fire. So they hit it. So then they're going to redirect and get it from another angle. So here they go. Yep. And the, you can see when they go in and out of the field, that dot disappears and comes back. And there's the needle coming in again and firing, and it hits. And it's just that simple. But not really, because they've also found that with targeted biopsies, the more the better. So they do recommend like you at least get two cores at minimum, and really three to four cores is going to improve your detection um, and sampling of the lesion, just like anything else. Because um, you have to line this software off, up with anatomic landmarks, and you can imagine that if you are slightly off and the lesion is small, you could miss it. So uh, more is always better. Uh, is that, and, and it's actually, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit tragic because, um, you know, when uh, we first started doing a lot of this research back in 2014 um, and the NIH was doing it, um, you know, the, the urologist I, I was working with um, who had just graduated from the NIH, um, Sarus Reis Barami, he said, this is it, Gordo, this is going to revolutionize prostate cancer detection. And I said, so, I'll be reading less cores, right? We'll go from like 12 cores down to like three to four cores. And he said, yes, that's right. We're going to do away with standard biopsy. So that didn't happen. Uh, so now we look at 12 cores plus the chart. So that really backfired. But still, I mean, it, it still has revolutionized things. But uh, I mean, you know, job security. Um, so the first thing they had to prove back when this all started was, I mean, baby steps, right? So they had to prove that what they were seeing on MRI, I mean, because you have to imagine, we spent like a very long time not being able to see prostate cancer, even with the best of MRI. So they had to prove that what we were seeing on MRI correlated with the radical prostatectomy, and that in, uh, the NIH did some really cool stuff um, with whole mounts, and also they uh, did um, molds of prostate glands so that every prostatectomy, they would create a, a 3D mold based on the MRI. Then when the prostate would come out, they would put it in this mold, and it had pre-positioned notches that lined up with each, uh, like, five millimeter MRI image. So that way when you sliced into the prostate along these notches, what section you were seeing on whole mount was exactly at the same level that they were seeing the MRI, which is super awesome. And I tried to get one of those 3D prostate mold printers, not because I needed one, but just because I wanted one and I couldn't, it was very sad. Um, it's another story. Okay, so there are different ways of doing um, targeted prostate biopsy. So I just showed you the Artemis, which is really cool because uh, for several reasons which I will show. But um, basically, you're still able to take the patient into clinic and without bringing them into the OR and doing general anesthesia, uh, you are able to use the uh, MRI to guide uh, the targeting of your biopsy. But you can actually do 
targeted biopsy directly in the MRI machine. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's the same thing, right? You still, you do the MRI, you find the lesion, you outline the prostate, and then you bring them back and you put them in. Uh, and then uh, while they're in the machine, you do the targeted approach. The problem is uh, space, number one. Uh, number two, the patient has to be sedated. This is not comfortable for them. Um, and uh, none of the needles can be metal, right? So be, you can imagine how badly that would go. So um, this is a lot more difficult to accomplish than doing your fu MRI ultrasound fusion guided biopsies. This one I think is great um, and I, because it's cognitive fusion. So cognitive fusion means you literally look at the MRI, you see the lesion, and then you do the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, but in your mind, you remember where the lesion is. Um, so that's a thing. Um, anyways, so wh which one is best? So uh, all three methods have overall prostate cancer detection compared with systemic, and that, that is fine. So, um, and you do have an increased detection of clinically significant cancers, decreased detection of the insignificant cancers, which we don't want to find in the first place. Um, but the best ones are really in bore and the MRI ultrasound fusion. As you can imagine, the cognitive fusion doesn't work as well because it is highly, highly, highly person dependent. I mean, you have to be really good at seeing that MRI and then in your mind, understanding that as it, it pertains to your ultrasound. I don't think I could do that. Um, so anyways, and uh, in studies, uh, not a lot of people can do it as well as relying on technology. So, um, and then when it comes to just, as I said, patient comfort and anesthetic needs and all this stuff, really the fusion biopsy is, is um, the way to go, in my personal opinion, and that's what we do. Um, and then we, you know, we did a bunch of research on this back at UAB, uh, you know, starting in 2014 when we started doing our own um, fusion, uh, MRI ultrasound fusion guided biopsies. Uh, because, you know, like the, the, the NIH can do anything, like they're magic. Um, they like grow unicorns and, and, and pixies there. But like when you get out into the real world and you can't hand pick your patients and you're in Birmingham, Alabama, the question is, can it work? Like that's great, it can work at the NIH, can it work in Birmingham, Alabama? And you know, we weren't sure. And the answer was, yeah, it could, you know? And um, so we were detecting more cancers. Um, we were detecting higher grade cancers. And, um, but when, wh then we really asked a terrifying question, um, which was, was this new technology influencing any way that we actually treat patients? Which really is a scary thing to ask because it's really disappointing if you have this new technology and it's getting you different results and it's not changing a darn thing you do. Um, and I think this is something we always need to ask ourselves as pathologists, uh, right, is that we can make, whatever changes we want, but if it's not changing patient care, then why are we doing it? Um, and so it turns out it was pa changing patient care, um, and that patients who had MRI-targeted biopsies were much more likely to go on active surveillance and stay there, okay? And that probably had a lot to do with uh, patient comfort. They could see their lesion. They, they know that we know what, what their cancer, what it is, where it is, and how it's behaving, and we can follow it, right? Uh, not just by biopsy and the pathology, but also on imaging. So, you know, um, if there's going to be extracapsular extension on imaging, uh, then that is, these, there are different, right, more metrics that you can follow that creates security. And so that the patients say, hey, even though I'm living with cancer in my body, I trust that you're going to get it out before it's too late, right? So it made a difference, and that was great. Um, and we did other studies, and other people have uh, done these studies as well, that MRI-targeted biopsy improves identification of uh, the highest grade tumor, or we like to call it the index lesion. Because remember, there's lots of multifocal tumors, but we really care about the highest volume tumor, the one that's going to be the highest grade. 
Um, it finds perineural invasion, uh, extra prostatic extension and cribriform morphology. Um, there have been articles that have reported better identification with MRI-targeted biopsy, which makes sense because uh, we also know that one of the downfalls of MRI of the prostate is it doesn't see very small tumors. But when you're really not wanting to take out people's prostates for those small tumors anyways, it's okay that they're basically invisible. Which means if you see this lesion on MRI, it's probably going to be more likely to be clinically significant at the start. Um, and then, unfortunately, despite my great hopes, uh, we are not getting rid of uh, the uh, standardized sextant um, random sampling anytime soon because Although small, there is a certain proportion of uh, biopsies that the highest grade tumor will not be on the MRI target lesion. You're going to find it in your random sampling. It also uh, is very helpful with men where what if the MRI is negative? What if, um, you know, uh, as I said, you have one of these smaller invisible lesions, but it happens to be higher grade, right? So all these what ifs exist. And it's in just enough people that it makes sense to continue doing this random um, systemic approach along with um, the targeted biopsy. Then I will tell you that, so there's new guidelines that are coming out um, that uh, by the AUA um, that are very supportive of MRI targeted biopsy. And it breaks it down into, you know, how do we use this on active surveillance? How do we use this on patients who've had a prior negative? How do we use this on patients who, um, uh, you know, have only undergone uh, standard biopsies up to this point, and 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 so it, it and and you know, or have gone undergone no biopsies at all, but have an elevated PSA. So, and and it has different recommendations for each one, um, which I will not bore you with. But basically, the combined approach is really. Um, uh, what's going to cause uh, you know you to find the most cancer diagnoses, including the most clinically significant cancers? Um, so there you go. All right. So moving on to other less clinical things, more pathology. So when you have prostate on the mind um, all the time, like I do, uh, you 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 go to sleep and you wake up at 2 a.m. and you're just like, <gasps> should we be clumping grading? Yeah, but seriously, it really happens. So um, because, you know, suddenly we went from a standard random approach where you're just shooting needles everywhere and hoping to hit something, and that's great. Um, and, and you do, and you hit cancer, and that's great, but, but who knows if that's really the index lesion or not. But that's a little different than if I draw a little circle and throw a needle into it four times, right? Because suddenly, instead of cores coming from everywhere, really all the cores are coming from one point. And so if you think about it conceptually, even though you're getting four cores, if you're taking it all from the same index lesion, it's basically like one gigantic core, right? So um, we are the first, I'm going to brag, we are the first to do this study <laughs> that looked at clumping versus not clumping um, in patients who had undergone targeted biopsy. And we cared about two things, really. Uh, volume on MRI, right, because, uh, because MRIs are much better at calculating tumor volume um, and gland volume than we are, uh, and uh, extra prostatic extension on radical prostatectomy. Because again, uh, the whole point is to get the cancer out before you have extra prostatic extension, right? And so you can see the individual core method versus the aggregate method. Um, and uh, it makes a big, it, well, in here it's, it's not as big a deal, but it can make a big difference, right? Because if you think about it, you have an entire core that's 3 plus 3 on one core, and then you have another core that's 10% 4 plus 4, okay? You have a 3 plus 3 and a 4 plus 4. If you report it separately, what does the urologist act on? Trick question. Anyone know? It's the, they were, that's right, they act on the 4 4. Yeah. Okay, because they are, that's how they're trained. They're trained that you go and plug into your prostate nomograms the highest grade on any core. But that's not exactly fair, right? Because this is all really from one lesion. So it's not really a 4-4 lesion. It can't be 
because there's an entire core of 3, 3 there. And you know it's all coming from the same lesion, right? But anyways, we kind of, so that was the concept going into it, but we still needed to prove it because, you know, we pretend to be scientists. Um, and sure enough, when we went through all of our uh, radical prostatectomies, we found a few things. Um, but number one, that clumping worked much better than non-clumping. So you have to take all of these cores, and you basically take all the tumor, and you squish it into like one little ball in your mind, and you say, that's your amount of tumor versus normal. So you, all your normal areas count, all your tumor areas count, and you take it all into account. And the grading is the same thing. It's all coming from one space, and so the grade has to be aggregated. Um, and we found better correlation with lesional density and with lesion volume. And what was fascinating is that only by doing the aggregate approach did we find it able to predict extra prostatic extension or radical prostatectomy. If you didn't aggregate, if you used an individual core approach, it was like shooting blind. There was no, it did not predict uh, EPE at all. Now, we couldn't make any conclusions in terms of grade at this point because, as you might guess, um, there was really a very few cases where there was a grade discrepancy between doing a single core and multiple cores. Because in most cases, you're going to have a little bit of grades on both cores. It was very rare where you had like four, five, and then a bunch of three, three, right? Um, but there was a, you know, uh, there was a couple. Um, but the, another uh, study that recently came out, um, uh, and I believe, yeah, American Journal of Surgical Pathology, they got enough cases together, and they looked at grade, and they found the same thing, which was that using a global or aggregate gay, a grade for all the positive cores from a single lesion um, was really the best way to go. It rarely led to downgrading at the time of radical prostatectomy. Um, and as you can imagine, the grade concordance improved as the number of cores went up, which is, again, which is why, um, you know, uh, uh, I know that our urologists at Vanderbilt, they do three cores or more. Um, and it's just because you're going to get a better sampling of your lesion. So bottom line is to aggregate. Um, and we also used um, the aggregate method of grading, and we did plug it into the um, Memorial Sloan uh, Kettering Cancer Center uh, pre-prostatectomy nomogram, which is a very, very popular nomogram to use that predicts, like, what's your chance of, you know, finding uh, metastatic prostate cancer in the lymph nodes when you do your lymph node dissection. Or, and, you know, it, it predicts these things. And, and it worked, um, was the, what our conclusion. So it was great. So... Um, and as I said, you know, the reason the individual core approach doesn't work for the aggregate is because instead of ha having these random scattered cores from anywhere, really, which may or may not be hitting your targeted, your index lesion, um, we finally have something that can hit the index lesion. And so everything you see there, you know, is coming from your tumor of interest. Um, and that is the tumor that most of the time is going to be driving the prognosis. Uh, and so this is, was uh, the new recommendations um, by both uh, GUPS and ISOP. Um, so they, they agreed on something, which is great. Uh, and that is aggregate, so, um, which is good because actually it's a lot easier to create a lump grade and a lump uh, tumor percentage than it is to report it on four separate needles in a single core. Plus, what if they fragment? You know, that happens all the time. And so it's just easier. Um, okay, so uh, moving on to more things about prostate cancer grading. Okay, so we all remember this original diagram when back in the day when CRIB was um, grade three, right? So no longer. Now it's uh, moved over to be a grade four, which is great. Um, except, and I'm sure everyone who has done prostate cancer research has run into this, Watch out for your past studies, right? So a lot of these past studies that said, you know, grade group one tumors or, you know, the Gleason score three plus threes, the ones that had metastases, those probably weren't uh, what we consider three plus threes, right? Um, and do not use pre-graded TMAs, archived tissue. You can't just pull up a report and copy down the grade. It does not work anymore. Um, 
We, uh, we're going through that right now. We had a beautiful cohort of, of paired um, African-American and Caucasian men, um, and all their cancers were graded a decade ago. And they're, I mean, they're basically all being regraded. It's, uh, uh, it's it, like, and it's over 100 cases, and, um, you know, a little tear just dropped down my cheek. Uh, but uh, we're doing it. But you, can't, uh, but you, just can't, you just can't print off the reports and use the grade. They're just not right. Um, but what's really important now, right? We are now living in the era of active surveillance. And so this is what matters right now. It's the grade group two tumors. Why are they so important? Because the reality is, and I like to think about things from a practical uh, perspective, the reality is your grade group three, four, and fives are going to have definitive therapy, okay? They're gonna get radiation or they're gonna have a radical prostatectomy, but they're, no, they're not going to be recommended to go on active surveillance. And the, if you go by the AUA guidelines, the grade group one tumors absolutely should go on active surveillance, right? So where does that leave us? That leaves us with the three plus fours, right? The grade group twos, where we know that some of them are really three threes. Okay, and how can I say this? Because, you know, on Monday I'm feeling really chipper. I go into the office and I'm like, three threes for everyone. And you get a three three and you get a three three. And then, you know, Friday hits and I'm like, four. They're all poorly formed. They're all three fours, you know. And I don't know, or maybe I didn't have my chocolate that day. But it's just, you know, and then you, but you show me that same case on Monday. Maybe it'll go back to a three three. I would like to think it won't, but it might, right? You know, and, and I call those the three and a halfers, right? So, you know, if something is grade 3.5, you probably should back off and call it three. But the fact is sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. And so this is very um, distressing for everyone, including the urologists. And so, of course, they're going to push the envelope. They're going to be like, well, we know... We know some of those three fours are three threes, so we want to put some of those on active surveillance, right? Um, and so the question is, which ones? And this is where we can really be helpful, I think. Okay, so percent pattern four, types of pattern four, IDCP and INEPE. All right, let's just go through these. All right, I love perineural invasion. Love it. Why? Because it is highly reproducible. It is more reproducible than grade. And there have been plenty of studies, and this has been argued back and forth, but if you look at the meta-analyses, there have been enough data out there that it's not good, right? If you see it on biopsy, I mean, what is it really saying, right? Because just about every prostatectomy has perineural invasion. But if you hit it on biopsy, probably there's a lot of it. Okay, I mean, that's kind of my thinking, right? And so that's probably why it works as a prognostic marker, because we know that prostate cancer's favorite way of getting out of the prostate is by hanging out with nerves, okay? So it's associated with all these poor prognostic indicators, so this can be very helpful if you're trying to decide whether to put someone on active surveillance or not. And as I said, it's highly reproducible. Great, same thing with extra prostatic extension. You see a case, it has a high volume disease that's going core, like tip to tip of the core. Always look at your ends because this is going to be really helpful to, when you're trying to decide whether to operate on someone or not, right? Because, uh, and I, yes, have I seen quote unquote three plus threes with EPE? Absolutely. Are they really three threes? No, it's a sampling issue. But I have picked it up on um, referral cases where it's been missed. Um, and then plus, you know, you get some bragging rights. You're like, I found the EPE on biopsy, and you, you feel cool for a minute. And then, like, you realize your resident has walked away and feel less cool. But anyways. OK. Um, I have kept this slide in here only as an example of how to never make a PowerPoint slide, ever. This is horrible. I, I don't even know what I'm looking at, and I'm the one who put it together. But it must have been some, like, like caffeinated moment where I was like, yes, yes, it's really small words, but if I just add more colors, it'll make more sense. Um, 
Anyways, so this is all about percent pattern four and, and, and is it useful to look at percent pattern four when you're trying to figure out uh, whether to put someone on active surveillance or not. Okay, um, and some of them accounted for crib reform, most didn't. There's a lot more studies, I'll get to them in the next page. And you can see the, the recommendations are kind of all over the place in terms of how much percent pattern four matters. Is it less than 25%? Is it less than 5%? Is it 10%? Um, and, and, you know, but generally speaking, uh, sorry, generally speaking, um, the idea is the same, or it's a similar message overall, which is basically the more percent pattern four you have, the more chance that you're going to have biochemical recurrence, just to kind of break it down. And somewhere between five and 10% pattern four is okay. Um, and, you know, but best used in combination with PSA, age, volume, et cetera, et cetera. All right. But again, small numbers in many of these, and not accounting for curve reform. And then I talk small numbers, like, I don't know, my papers, whenever I try to pull this, they get rejected. So patients with a Gleason score of 3 plus 4 equals 7 on biopsy and a highest percentage of Gleason pattern 4, less than 5%, similar candidates for active surveillance as men who have a Gleason score 6 cancers. Um, N of 45. So, you know, and, but good for them. They got published, and I'm not um, dissing on this uh, paper. I actually like this paper. But I think you just have to be very careful about making strong statements when you have very low numbers. They also did not count for curb reform morphology. Um, and this is my biggest problem with percent pattern four. It's the, what I like to call the ladybug phenomenon. Why ladybugs? Because my youngest... Um, Small human at home likes ladybugs. I don't know, they're beetles, they're gross, whatever. Okay, so pattern three is the leaf, pattern four is the bug, all right? What percent pattern four is there? It's about, you know, 10% bug. So it's about 10% pattern four, right? Okay, we agree. So it's a grade group two tumor, it's 10% bug, they can go on active surveillance. Okay, now I've only sampled a piece of this leaf. So now, that's 40% bug, right? So now they can't go on active surveillance, right? Because now it's a grade group two, but it's almost a grade group three tumor. And is it crib reform? Because it has little dots, right? I don't know. Um, but the thing is, it's all sampling, right? This is all the same person. It's just how the needle went through the lesion that matters. And so when you have very small foci, it is very easy to overcall the amount of percent pattern four. And that is my biggest issue with calling percent pattern four. I think you have to be very, very careful. Um, so mind blown, right? All right. Goodbye, bugs. And yeah, it happens. Um, so this was a case that I recently had. Uh, this is uh, a very small focus of tumor. Are you going to give a percent pattern four on that? I mean, I'm not. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just hope, I'm just like grateful if I can get to a grade on that. I, I stained it praying that the big glob uh, that looks kind of glomeruloid uh, was actually not invasive. Um, of course it was. So this is the problem. So you, I, I highly recommend you do not give a percent pattern four on these types of things because you will way overestimate it. Um, this is a quiz question. Moving on to the crib reform issue that was raised by our friend the bug. Uh, raise small audience, but we'll poll you guys. Invasive, raise hands. Introductal carcinoma of the prostate. Okay, so the IDCs have it. So that one's invasive. <laughs> And, and I just love this because I thought it was all IDC too. Yeah, so um, you can't tell, right? You just can't tell until you stain it. That's a problem. Um, so here we go. Uh, Swiss cheese is crib reform. Everyone can agree with this. There's uh, people complain and about like, can we really tell crib versus non-crib? I think most of us can, you know? Um, and you can see that uh, this is our invasive crib reform cancer. Uh, beautiful. This looks identical, but it's introductal carcinoma of the prostate, which is fantastic. 
uh, and they look the same. And the only way you can tell the difference is by staining them. This is a picture of my youngest human holding a turtle. Um, and that expression on her face is the same expression when I try to explain introductal carcinoma of the prostate versus invasive curviform cancer to interns. Okay? And honestly, sometimes I feel like this. Um, also, I did not give her that. That was my husband who, they were on a hike and he was like, look, a turtle, here, hold it. And I was like, you know, salmonella. But anyways, she's fine. Um, turtle, look at the turtles hiding for dear life. But it's confusing. So, um, and oftentimes they're seen together, which is great, but sometimes they're not. And we do know that there are some differences between them. Uh, P10 loss, much more common in introductal carcinoma of the prostate, not so much in invasive curviform cancer. Why is that? Well, we're looking into it. And maybe it's the tumor microenvironment, maybe not. Um, and many studies lump them. Why? Because think about it, if you don't want to lump them in a study, you're going to have to stain every area of that prostatectomy that has cribriform cancer, right? And that is painful and expensive. And so people tend not to do it. But are we going to really do routine staining on every single cribriform cancer on all the slides? No, I would say no. That's, it's not practical. It's not, uh, if, uh, it's not effective. It's not efficient. Um, and how does that pertain to grading? Um, Right, no, we're not, not going there. So um, another horrible slide, but I'll just run through it very quickly, which is basically that even though we have issues with not enough studies separating IDC and invasive cribriform cancer, because we don't, but the fact is there's a similar message here. And remember that Realistically speaking, we probably don't need to separate them in most studies because they tend to be together anyways. Because the thought is this is probably an inside, uh, sorry, an outside in phenomenon, meaning the invasive tumor starts on the outside and busts its way into the glands. And if that is true, then in most cases you are going to see them both depending on where you look. Um, but you can see that they are predictive of biochemical recurrence. They're predictive of metastases, uh, local and distant, extraprostatic extension, upgrading, uh, stage, uh, you name it, all the things that tell you if I see cribriform tumor, I probably don't want to put that person on active surveillance, right? So, and I, but again, the caveat is always there that the majority of these studies are not looking at the grade group two tumors, which are the ones we're interested in in the first place, right? So you always have to bring it back to what are the clinicians really caring about? And it's really a very small subset of patients. Um, but in case, there are more studies that have separated them. Uh, and again, it's the same message. Uh, these patients have biochemical recurrence, they have metastases, right? Uh, they have extraprostatic extension and, um, and worse stage. But when you do split out the IDC, I think the message becomes a little bit unclear. Is it important or not? Or is it in the invasive that is important or not? And what is driving um, you know, this prognosis? Uh, and and um, I'll tell you, based on the study we did at Vanderbilt, we felt like it was the invasive cribriform cancer that was driving it. But not all studies have shown that. Um, and then we tend to forget about other things that have shown to be prognostic, like glomeruloid uh, morphology, right? Uh, we found glomeruloid morphology decreased the risk of biochemical co-recurrence. So how does that work into all these other studies, right? Um, and then what about percent pattern four? Because we have to think about percent pattern four in terms of were those ones that progressed, were those ones that simply just had cribriform morphology? Uh, and, and we don't know. Um, so there's still a lot of questions. But generally speaking, I think this general idea, at least now from the current literature, is that curbiform is bad. OK. Um, but you do have to be careful when making these statements, because not too long ago, we said that uh, patients who had introductal carcinoma of the prostate were more likely to have germline mutations in BRCA2. Since then, other papers have said that is not the case. But the guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, were changed 
based on that initial study. And that may not have been the right thing to do. And again, it leaves the urologist guessing, right? All right. But uh, generally speaking, as I said, it's bad. It's an independent predictor of biochemical recurrence, higher grade, higher stage, metastases, and disease-specific survival. We should report it, and we should be careful about those patients who have it, and they should not go on active surveillance. Okay? And that is really the bottom line in that. Um, so that is a dead horse that has been beaten. Excellent. We got it. We got the horse. But we're still having issues with definition of cribriform, with detection of cribriform, and with other patterns. This is cribriform, right? Some of it's very obvious. But uh, there have been consensus papers that have come out that have tried um, to uh, basically specify exactly what we think is cribriform cancer and what is not. Um, so yes, this is cribriform. Yes, that is cribriform. Yes, that is cribriform. But these are not. These are papillary, they're mucinous fibroplasia, they're glomeruloid, uh, but they're not uh, cribriform. Two minutes? All right. Well, um, we're going to go really fast here. There have been other consensus uh, papers that have basically shown the same thing. We have to keep in mind that there is low sensitivity for detection of cribriform cancer on biopsy to start with. Um, We've done studies at Vanderbilt on trying to recruit these patients so that we could harvest their tissue fresh. Um, it is very hard to do because of the low detection on biopsy. It is hard to harvest it because you cannot see it on radical prostatectomy uh, when you slice it open. And so basically that's where I came in and did frozen sections on these things to try to find it. And we did, but it was very time consuming. Uh, and we were able to do some molecular studies. Um, but you can see our final N from where we started, considering we had uh, 224 screened, and what we really wound up collecting at the end was eight. So it's difficult to study these tumors in this particular morphology. And then what about, you know, focal crib? If you know in the CAP checklist, if this is your only area of crib, is it yes? Does that have the same prognosis as something that is full of cribriform cancer? I doubt it. What about glom crib? Ah, uh, glom crib. Love, love the glom crib. Um, you know, what about P10 loss? How does that factor into all this stuff? Um, so I, I report cribriform morphology because I think there's enough literature there that says it's important. I think it's helpful in screening out patients who probably shouldn't be put on active surveillance. Um, and we do know that we still undergrade on biopsy and the majority, well, not the majority of the time, but in a significant uh, amount of the time. Um, but it doesn't matter in these tumors. It doesn't matter in those tumors. And yes, it might matter in something like this if you had some cribriform glands here. Maybe because really you want to look at the PSA and what does the MRI look like in the family history and what your patient wants to do. So... It's really, yes, report it, but it's a discussion starting point, not an end point. We still have a lot of things we still need to study, right? Um, but in conclusion, report it. Caution people about going on active surveillance uh, with it. Watch out for the amount of pattern four that patients have when they get put on active surveillance. Um, anything 20% or uh, above makes me very uncomfortable. Um, but we need to still can study the percent pattern four in the context of curb reform pattern. This is natural forming BPH. All right, thank you. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> no, no, really, don't clap. Uh, questions, concerns, comments? Let's see, I can open the chat box. Hey, Jennifer, this is, this is Larry. Hi. Hi. Um, so I heard you say if there's a pyrads five, I guess four or five, that's biopsy, and in the biopsy you don't see cancer or you don't see a high grade cancer, you level into the box. I do. So, I, and I don't think that's. I certainly don't think that's standard. And I will tell you, I don't think everyone that is at Vandy does this, but I do. And maybe I'm biased because I'm a big believer in this uh, technology.
but also because it's worked for me. But I don't do it for Pyrads 4 lesions, but if something is Pyrads 5 and it looks like completely normal benign prostate, then I will generally get an extra level. But what's your yield on that? I'd say it's low. It's probably honestly about 10%. Okay. But it's enough that I do it um, because, it, you know, I don't like leaving the diagnosis in the block. And also, I will tell you, if there's cancer on, like, every other part, then no way. I'm not leveling. But if it is a totally negative prostate biopsy and a negative PIRADS-5 lesion, I'm getting levels, absolutely. Before I sign that thing out as cancer-free, it's getting levels. Just levels on the... Just on the target, yeah. Uh, do your clinicians provide a PIRADS? We don't get the PIRADS. They do. They provide a PIRADS for every lesion. Because they love me. I don't know. <laughs> and also, I threaten them at, at tumor board. I'm like, don't you forget your PIRADS. They're like, OK. Yeah. Anyway, not really. Oh, yes, sorry. OK, please complete your seminar evaluation form. But only if you have nice things to say. And. <laughs> And here is a square <laughs> with little black and white pixels. Is that Gleason pattern three or four? Sorry, yes. Jennifer, another, another question. Uh, um, our clinicians have asked us not to report perineural invasion. It does make a difference for their decisions, and they spend a long time just describing what perineural invasion is to patients? So th I would say they're lazy and wrong. Um, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that? That's the former surgeon in me coming out. So yeah, you know, it, I, I love people ignoring what I have to say actually because like, and I'm used to it, that's, that's why I had kids, was so I could practice telling people good advice and then having them ignore me. So that's cool, that's cool. But, um, but then to ignore the vast amount of literature that has been written about it, I think is foolish. And yeah, it's hard to explain things, you know, that's why we're in an academic institution and we teach. But I, I, you know, it's easy for them, I would say this, I'd rather they know it and then not know it because I do think it's important. I think the literature supports that it's important. And if at the end of the day, they want to use all their other clinical information to decide a treatment pathway, then that is fine. But I don't want them to decide that treatment pathway without having all the information, especially if I think it's clinically significant, which I do. So I report perineural invasion, and quite frankly, if a, patho if, a, if a urologist, if a pathologist told me not to do it, I might have a conversation with them. But if a urologist tells me how to do my job, then we're going to have words. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. Yes. I'm not a pathologist, and here's my disclaimer. I work with transplant patients. They are immunosuppressed. So how immunosuppression play a role? It changes the way you're going to treat your patient. Because if in, even if in a low-risk patient with immunosuppression, I would say it's a higher risk in any case. So I will go for surgery instead of surveillance. Yeah, that is a, wow, that's a great question. Uh, I guess I would say immunosuppressed how? Are we talking like organ transplant? Are we talking, you know, uh, AIDS? Uh, you know, what, what, what kind of... What I mean, immunosuppression will go from patients with autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or transplantations. They are... Mm, transplantation is highly immunosuppressed. Rheumatoid arthritis maybe is mid-term, but both are immunosuppressed and that plays a role in how your immune system will see the cancer. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That's really interesting. It also makes me think about how I would do my targeted or, or how I would do a biopsy because, you know, we're also now starting to do a more transperineal uh, prostate biopsies, which is thought to decrease the risk of infection after the procedure, right, as opposed to the transrectal approach. I'm wondering, so the first thing that just popped into my head was would those patients actually benefit from doing a transperineal approach and avoid um, you know, the rectum and the bowel prep and all that stuff. Um, I, I would have to look, I, I have not read articles on that. I think that'd be something to, to look into. And I, I don't have enough uh, personal experience with immunocompromised patients um, to comment on that. But I think that's, I think that's a fascinating question.
And I even wonder if those patients wouldn't be better suited, and I'm sorry, urologists, um, for radiation. Better suited for radiation than... Well, than surgery. Well, I just think about immunocompromised, wound healing, post-op infection, and all these things. Um, I don't know. I guess that's the answer. I don't know, but I, I would love to study it. But in terms of cancer progression, yes. I think that surgery is always better than it, Yeah, I'm not so sure. I, I think it, it does, it, you know, I guess the first thing I'd want to know is with each, I mean, I guess I wouldn't, I would also hesitate to clump all immunocompromised patients into one group. I would also say, what is the life expectancy of each individual patient? So, for example, if, if someone has end-stage renal disease, and I know they have a 50% chance of making it in the next five years, I don't think I'd operate on that person because I think it would probably be unlikely they would die of prostate cancer in the next five years, right? So I think, yeah. uh, I, I, I think you would, I, it would have to be a really tailored decision. Okay, so I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm getting the, the, my head's going to get chopped off signal. Um, thank you so much for having me here to talk. This was really fun. Thank you. Thank you.